Hello folks, welcome back to World War 2 TV and I have gained a few new subscribers, possibly because of having JD from History Underground on yesterday who seems to bring in some of his masses uh, to my channel, which is great. If you are new because of discovering me via JD or Soul David, then thank you for joining us here. If you would consider becoming a patron, a subscriber, uh, sharing what we're doing on social media, that would be appreciated. And just to remind you, all the links you always need are in the description on YouTube. So open that bit up and you have all the links to our guests, websites, their books, merchandise, social media links, etc., etc. So today, I'm kind of really excited about this show because it's not just history. It is history, but it's about a very worthwhile and meaningful project. One of the things we are all aware of is that the wars, whichever war we're talking about, Great War, First, Second World War, Korean War, Vietnam, they're not really over if you have a loved one who served in that war who has never been officially accounted for. Many, of course, have a grave. Many, of course, came back wounded, but it's those ones who just have no known grave. And today we're focusing on the Marines, the U.S. Marines, of course. And my guest, Jeffrey Raker, has been running an incredible website uh, about his project, Missing Marines. He has a book, Leaving Mac Behind, about the missing Marines on Guadalcanal. And he is going to come and tell us all about the project, some of the cases they're investigating. And as you will find out, it is an ongoing project. There are still teams out there. There are still people diligently working away, researching, trying to find uh, traces of these missing heroes. So I'm going to bring Jeffrey in now. So, um Jeffrey Wake, everybody. So uh, good afternoon, sir. How are you today? I'm very well, Paul. Thank you. So glad to be here. Well, thank, um, thank you for coming along. And it's all, it's all a credit is due to Dave, David Hollands over in Australia, who is the Guadalcanal expert, who said you must have Jeffrey on because he's doing important work. And it's, you know, alongside the historians, alongside the, uh, the, the, the authors and the, the, the professors of history, I mean, you are you are in the history field, but it's you're you're, you're balancing lots of um, <laughs> uh, keep plates keep plates spinning, wearing the multiple hats because this is kind of a, a social media project. It's a research project. It's reaching out to people. It's it's fundraising, mm -hmm. selling books. So, tell us a little bit about yourself and what the project is, and then and then we'll let you do your full presentation. But just a kind I, of a thumbnail sure. sketch. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, it is it is a uh, it's almost a full time job on top of the full time job I uh, currently have, and being the uh, being the father of a very full time three and a half year old, um, <laughs> and I do um, everything about the website. I run that one. I run also one about uh, the first battalion, twenty fourth Marines. Um, I do all the research, all the writing, all the web updates, maintenance, all that by myself. Um, so it takes a, a good amount of time. Uh, so that will explain hopefully any errors you might encounter when you're on any of those sites. Um, I have to running my own shop up here. Um, but yeah, I got a, it's interesting you said that in your intro, Paul, because that's kind of how I got introduced to the entire concept of uh, missing in action. Um, I was about 10 years old. Um, I remember being in a bookstore with my grandmother and um, we had a deal, uh, I think, where if I were to memorize certain uh, Bible passages, she would buy me a book. Um, I'm not a religious person by any means, but I do know a good deal. So um, I went and I picked out uh, Lost Ships of Guadalcanal uh, mm. by Dr. Ballard. And I was looking through the book and I'm reading, you know, looking at the pictures. I didn't know very much. I had never heard of Guadalcanal before. I'd never heard of any of this, but, you know, any what, what 10 year old doesn't want a book about warships? Um, and my grandmother came up behind me and she looked over my shoulder and she said, oh, she's like, oh, that looks like the Quincy. And yes, it was. It was, um, it was the USS Quincy, um, a cruiser which was sunk at the Battle of Saddle Island. And um, okay, my grandmother, how did you know? Um, and she says, oh, well, your, uh, you know, your great, great uncle Ned served on that ship and he was killed. And um, a, a couple pages later, if anyone has that book, there's a description of uh, Ned Billings, um, who's this fellow right here, um, his final moments um, coming out of the bridge of the Quincy as it's on fire and burning and half of his face apparently is gone and his last words to a shocked young ensign where everything will be fine, son, the ship will go down fighting. Um, so you can imagine the effect that that had on a 10 year old. Um, and also it got me to thinking a little, you know, several years later, you know, the effect that that must have had on my grandmother. Um, she was a member of her family. I don't think she ever, I don't think she ever read that passage and I, I sort of hope that she didn't. Um, but what that 
you know, what that loss must have meant to her. Um, a few years later, I um, became aware of a Marine ancestor of mine who also was killed in the Pacific at Saipan. Um, his body was recovered and brought home. He was very much a family hero. Uh, his name was mentioned frequently at gatherings, and he was much closer to my grandmother's age. It was her cousin, uh, her first cousin. I decided I wanted to learn as much about this, you know, this fascinating person as I could. And as I was interviewing um, veterans uh, of his unit, you know, got to know, got to hear names, got to hear stories. And the name of this one sergeant, Arthur Urban, kept coming up. Um, Arthur Urban is a, uh, he's a guy right out of, uh, he's, he's the Hollywood version of a Marine sergeant, um, young, scrappy, uh, in trouble for car thieving, but then gets out and joins the Raiders. And he's got he's got a phenomenal story, recipient of the Navy Cross, recipient of the Bronze Star. And he and my, uh, you know, Yale educated uh, ectomorphic ancestor um, became best friends, even though one was the first lieutenant, the other was a sergeant. Um, they were both killed in the same patrol action on Saipan. And I learned uh, through researching that, that the sergeant had never been identified and he was still on the missing list and that didn't make any sense to me. So I started, you know, I wanted to figure out what had happened. And um, that sort of opened up the, uh, opened up the rabbit hole uh, to this because there, there are so many, there are so many stories like this that are, that are untold. Um, and uh, yeah, for a lot of these guys, they're just names on a, they don't have markers. Really, or if they do, they're they're just seen at or they've got you know their names are on big memorials in Manila or in Honolulu, um, but they all have people who missed them all their way, who were devastated by their loss, and who you know, grew up not knowing what happened to them. Um, a lot of cases of you know parents refusing to believe that their son was really dead, um, corresponding with the Marine Corps for years. Uh, you've got kids growing up not knowing whatever became of their fathers. You know they're thinking, oh, he got amnesia, or oh, he just didn't want to come back and he ran away. And you know, so sort of trying to put all those pieces back together uh, for people is really kind of the impetus behind starting the uh, starting the whole missing Marines project. Um, but it was that um, that personal family connection to uh, the Guadalcanal campaign um, that really got me sort of focused on um, this particular. Uh, era as a case study for the book, um, as it was also the first time um, the Marines were really challenged to uh, handle large quantities of dead or to make preparations for how they were going to handle their casualties. Um, it's not to say they didn't have large ones before. I mean, there was, of course, Lake Island, there was Bataan, there's Corregidor, um, but you didn't get a whole lot of accumulated knowledge out of those engagements because the garrisons there were wiped out or captured. Um, and this was a big you know, division-wide thing. So, um, so we can get into the presentation a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you made that point because Saul David made the point about Guadalcanal being very much uh, the bridging of, of kind of the, the, the pre-war way of Marines going to war and then the lat later war when things, they've got yeah. LV to things that. But to think about it as being the kind of the learning curve about the handling of the dead, that's something that I, yeah. I guess most people watching hadn't thought about that. But yeah, it, it's going to be the, the largest volume they've encountered so far. And, and, and of course, people missing and wounds. So yeah, well, anyway, yeah. you've come at, with, a, with a pretty epic um, number of slides in your PowerPoint. So we'll <laughs> hand over to you. To, to we'll try to to if you have questions, from, I think we'll handle them as we go along. I think, honestly, we'll cover a lot of stuff just with Jeffrey's presentation, but we, we, of course, we always welcome your comments, but basically over to you, Jeffrey. Okay, um, great. So this is, uh, introduce this picture a little bit. This was by a Marine combat artist who was on Guadalcanal, uh, Donald Dixon. Um, the title of this painting is uh, Poor Old Joe. Um, as you can see, he's, his Marine here has uh, lost somebody. What always guts me about this picture is you see the dog tag lying on the ground right there and my greatest registration minus thinking is like no that should be that should go with the body and as you'll see there are a lot of cases where a dog tag like that results in a mistaken or a lost identity um okay so i'm going to start off a little bit um we won't go too deep into the history of graves registration but i wanted to kind of set up a little bit about why this is a struggle um for the marines in particular but really for all branches um so after the Great War ends, um, the Marines start facing this. They're they're struggling to stay relevant, really. They're trying not to get, and if there's any Marines in the audience, there's always been that, that fear of being 
being roped into the army or roped into the navy and having you know, independent designation taken away. Um, the public, uh, you know, the, the public perception of the Marines in the Great War was very, very positive. Um, but they are getting away from their original designation. They're fielding land units. I said, well, why can't the army do that? Um, so the Marine argument um, put forward is that, well, you will need um, a force. The original Marine objective as part of the Navy is to project force ashore. It's like, you will need these aboard ships. You will need us to, you know, whenever there's there's small small wars, they're called like the banana wars in the 1920s. But you need the Marines to go out there, fight these sort of like limited engagements. Um, and so necessarily because they were sort of facing this, this um, perception of being redundant and also a very, very low budget, um, they had to focus really, really tightly on becoming a force of amphibious shock troops. Um, they participated, I mean, they also said they, they, guard, they guarded the mail going back and forth across the United States. They, had, they wore a lot of different hats, but this was really started to become their primary objective um, in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Um, the problem with this, though, is this, the next bullet is a quote from um, Merrill Twining, who would go on to serve on Guadalcanal. It's, Logistics cost money, and we had none. Um, the landing exercises that they managed to put forward in the 1930s, called uh, Fleet Landing Exercises, or FLEX, um, were very, very limited. They could get a couple of ships. They could land one regiment at a time. They couldn't um, really practice what later became called trifibious warfare, which is, you know, having troops ashore supported by Navy, supported by Air Force, supported by air power. Um, and it'd be it's supposed to be sort of a, a simulacrum of what they would encounter, um, but wound up not, not really being. Um, Twining has a wonderful memoir, and he mentions that nobody, until the Guadalcanal campaign, nobody knew, in the 1st Marine Division, knew what a full unit of fire for a division looked like. They didn't know how much space, you know, 60 days rations for that many men took if they'd never had that to train with. Um, and as a consequence, planning suffered. You'll hear a lot about um, Guadalcanal being Operation Shoestring, but we won't get into the full logistics there. Kind of the point is the Marines really, they don't have a lot of money to do pretty much anything than focus on what's essentially mission critical. They have only eight specialist training schools until 1939. That's not a lot, but the Standing Marine Corps is only about 18,000 at that point. When it starts expanding you know, in the next the next year, um, they really started to struggle to hit those, um, to get enough specialists in there. Um, and they had sort of this expectation that they would always be operating with the Navy or the Army for logistical support. The Marines would go in, you know, do the hard fighting, secure the beachhead, and then once the perimeter was secure, the Army would come in, the Marines would be pulled out, and they would go on to the next thing any sort of occupational duty, anything like that would be handed over to the army, um, which that includes quartermaster details uh, and the army graves registration service. Um, they assumed a little bit too much that the army was maintaining standing graves registration service. Um, again, this is public perception. We just fought the war to end all wars. We're not going to need to handle this many casualties ever again. Why would we, you know, use the you know, the army has a very limited budget too, limited recruitment. Why would we maintain standing graves registration units? You know, that's a good, almost that's that's almost admitting, you know, that the war to end all wars was not that. Um, as you can imagine, they're trying to they're making these arguments uh, from um, in the early 1920s as they're bringing the bodies back, as you know, the tomb of the unknown soldiers being dedicated. They are not, you know, the public does not want anything wants no hint that anything like this will ever happen again. Mm -hmm. So graves registration units were, you know, the ones that had been called up for service in the Great War were disbanded. Um, the quote below is from Edward Steer, who wrote a phenomenal, probably probably the book on graves registration um, in World War II. And said the peacetime US Army had no organizations of this sort for commercial morticians always available to care for its dead. The Navy had a similar policy where there are a couple of pages in the manual uh, for training chaplains that have to do with, you know, handling handling remains, but it's all very um, it's all very focused on. Well, here, how's you, here's how you preserve a body long enough to get it to a railhead to ship it across the country. Um, here's the correct services to say they're not focused on casualties at scale. It starts to become a little bit more apparent as they're watching the encroaching war in Europe that something's going to have to be done. Perhaps the United States isn't going to be getting involved. And you know, they start revising some of the older doctrines. Um, 
and they finally put out technical manual 10360 grants registration, which is this. And it comes out in September 1941. So not a lot of lead time before Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> and as Edward Sears says, a graves registration doctrine nicely adjusted to conventional methods of land warfare could not be readily adapted to a situation without parallel in the annals of American military history, speaking specifically about the situation that the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps face in the Pacific. So <clears throat> this isn't to say that the Marines went in completely unprepared at all. Um, as the 1st Marine Division is getting ready to ship out, as I'm sure everyone who's studied Guadalcanal knows, there was a very, very short period of time between mobilizing the division, training, shipping them out, getting them to, um, getting them overseas. Uh, Vandergrift thinks he's gonna have months to prepare for his next, you know, his next objective. He's told he has a few weeks. He has to finish training, he has to do as much training as he can. He has to gather all the intelligence that he can. Um, he has to unload, reload all of his transports in a very, very short period of time. But in the middle of that, they're issuing just a ton of ton of paperwork. And one of the things that comes out of that is a circular um, that is issued for you know care of the dead. Um, it sounds like whoever, you know, the uh, staff officer who wrote it probably had a copy of the Graves Registration Manual, but they were not in wide circulation. It was not something that was... Um, you know, issued a really, you know, what, nobody, nobody had training in this um, by the time the Marines hit Guadalcanal and Tulagi and Gabutu on the 7th of August, 1942. Um, we won't get into the details of the landings. Everybody knows the Guadalcanal landing was largely unopposed, um, whereas Tulagi and Gabutu were much a different story. Um, Gavutu is an interesting case because this was the first, um, this is considered to be the first uh, American field cemetery dedicated in the South Pacific. Uh, Gavutu was put together by a chaplain who very fortunately had some training as an undertaker in real life, his, in, um, in his civilian life rather. Uh, his name was Chaplain Warren Wyeth Willard. Um, he would later be on anybody who studied Tarawa. He became a very famous figure after the Battle of Tarawa, but he was in charge of putting this together. And he had no real instructions outside of what he would have read in his training manual for how to accomplish this sort of thing. So what you're seeing here, this is after it's been it's been neatened and cleaned up quite a bit. Um, so I think believe these pictures of the crosses were taken in 1944. Skabutu was an occupied base by that time. Um, but yeah, so these are members of the 2nd Marines, members of the, uh, uh, the Paramarines um, who were killed. Um, and Willard has a book called The Leathernecks Come Through. I'd like to read a little excerpt from that um, about the experience of establishing this first cemetery. <clears throat> so it says, Back at Gavutu, a grim task of burying the dead awaited me. In tropical countries, decomposition takes place much more rapidly than in semi-tropical or temperate zones. Some of the men had been dead since Friday. Others had been killed on Saturday. A strong, foul odor was noticeable in the region round about the rendezvous of the dead. I had to hurry to find a site for the cemetery. Officers with whom I talked about the matter wanted it to be near the southeast of Lever's store, which is the building in the background. I agreed to carry out their wishes. Volunteers were secured to carry away, uh, clear away the large cement columns which had been used for the foundation of a house in that area. We also removed two immense iron water containers which had been perforated by bullets. Then began the digging of individual graves. The sun grew hot in the skies above me and scorched the earth beneath. The men's dungarees became wringing wet. As soon as eight or 10 graves were dug, we would lay down the bodies of our fallen comrades. There were no caskets, no flowers, none of the niceties which had always been necessities at home. Some of the members of the working party fainted because of the heat or the sight of the bloody and stiffened bodies of their friends. And then I would have to recruit other volunteers or else from time to time, I would help lower the remains into their final resting place. The working party seemed to melt away. Sporadic fighting was still taking place on both islands. The sound of the shuttles blended with the sound of rifle fire. I secured three assistants. <clears throat> These men made a map of the cemetery for me, which is what you're seeing right here. This is his original copy. Um, they took the valuables from the clothing of the dead and placed them in envelopes. These were sealed and on each was written the owner's name. The identification tags were removed and placed in separate containers. I read the names of our friends whom we were saying goodbye. 
Among them were the following, Woods, Crane, Brule, Hetzel, Williams, Murray, Remenerick, Weisbrod, Mack, Walker, Cooper, Liston, Kennedy, Hirschberg, Grady, Johns, Demetrius, Berzelkowski, Hennessy, Walton, Pomeroy, Vincent, Driscoll, Campbell, Kaiser, Mason, Sweeney, Keeg, Kutlis, Jensen, Young, Newtson, Kaczynski, Wilson. There were many others. It seemed as though all America was represented there in that little city of the dead. So that's probably the first um, official, you know, the, the, this is the first long lasting cemetery, uh, American cemetery established in the South Pacific. Well, I have to um, say, Jeff, my, I'm, I'm pretty kind of, it's one of my World War II TV moments when it, it's just amazing to think that there's a campaign starting and it's during the campaign that someone actually has to improvise the idea of temporary cemeteries and how to do it. And they're following, they're, they're following their own instincts. It's, I mean, I'm living in Normandy, so I've still, you know, the war has been raging for years. There's a protocol. Mm -hmm. Everything's forms. Everything's got paper. I know that we're talking about the British Army, American Army, and all sorts of, other, all sorts of organizations. But it is mm -hmm. just, it's mind blowing to think that this is beginning and someone's having to kind of come up with a way of doing it. It's astonishing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really is. But as, I mean, as you can see, a lot of this is, it's sort of based on common sense. You take identify, you take personal effects, you take down their identifications, you write down the names as they're going, bury them distinctly separately. So, and this is not to say that. Willard's map here is completely without mistakes. There are at least three errors that we know of, um, including the first unknown, uh, Amer um, potentially American. Willard's pretty convinced he was a Marine, but we don't really know. Um, as you can see, that's his grave there, number one, unknown Marine. Um, the sketch here is taken from uh, what's called an X-File. Uh, it's a, the paperwork they have on unidentified um, remains. Chris created in 1947. As you can see, this individual is just a pair of legs. Um, everything else was missing. Um, Willard found them in the water, carried them up here, and they buried him. He got to be great number one as the, uh, the first time. This person, to my knowledge, is still unidentified. Um, you know, there's been some work done on uh, the three Gabutu on the, um, identity issues uh, recently, but I'm not, I can't, cannot speak to, um, how that's how that's progressing i don't have that sort of insider knowledge but yeah um so there we go and we just got a, a Log question uh, did, did yes. marines have two dog tags at that time was that they that were supposed story? to um they were supposed to that was a big problem to so the paramarines in particular a lot of them shipped out without having dog tags issued um there are uh, accounts of them having to make their own um with uh die sets on the ship over to uh, to the invasion. Um, dog tags are small. They're, they're easily, easily lost. Um, if you wind up with a fellow like X1 there, um, you know, the top half of his body is gone. There's not much. They, was, they were always worn on a, you want a, str on a string around the neck or they were, sometimes they were carried in pockets. Um, they could easily be lost. They didn't have that uh, sort of convention of tying one to your boot. Um, as far as I know, I mean, individuals may have done that, but it wasn't as, it wasn't a common practice thing. They were usually two right around the neck. Um, you were, one was supposed to stay with the body at all times and the other one was taken and given to the officer in charge or the graves reg registration representative. So they would have a record of it. Um, but you did have a lot of cases where people who didn't know any better would take both tags to the, to the officer in charge and hand them to them and say, all right, well, where did you get these from? And then they can't go and point back to who they took them from. And then you've, you've lost that person's identity already, um, or cop or made it much more difficult to figure out. Um, just a little quick bit about Tulagi. Um, Tulagi was, a, was an active cemetery through the end of the war. Um, there were three known burial sites right after the battle. They were later consolidated into this one on White Beach. Um, process of consolidation also resulted in a lot of mistakes because if you're moving, the more, the more times you move a body, the more likely it is that you're going to lose uh, either identifying, you know, identifying pieces or bones. Um, so there are actually several of the unknowns from Tulagi um where you can sort of like trace them you know that they were buried earlier in the war but towards the end of the war they said oh, actually this isn't who we thought they were or we don't know where they are um so again they're trying they're trying to do they're doing their best under difficult circumstances um this picture is from uh uh pete flahaven for those of you who know him um he's got a really wonderful collection of uh cemetery photos a lot of them are in here um <clears throat> So we can move on to Guadalcanal now, finally. Um, this is the first picture, first known picture of the division cemetery, um, what would become the Army, Navy, Marine Corps Cemetery in Guadalcanal. Um, the cross right up in the upper left there is row one, grave one. Um, this was taken a little uh, shortly, 
uh, after the Battle for Alligator Creek. Um, it may be hard to see on your computers, but some of the names are legible in this photo, which is pretty cool. And they're members of the 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines. Um, and again, this was this was sort of set up. This was done by units. Um, they would have there's like a rotating cast of chaplains from the division who would come down, would oversee the burials, um, you know, provide services, that sort of thing. But a lot of these were being done. Um, guys were bringing in their friends, um, and from the other, you know, you know, they would come to bring them in from the front lines. Um, you know, buried by buddies, identified at the time. Um, yeah, and. Um, there's a very there's a good account. I think the veteran's name is Lester Clark, and he talks about uh, they spent a, they spent a day burying all the dead from uh, two one who were killed on uh, Alligator Creek, which are these guys right here. Um, this expanded rapidly as it went um, by January of 1943, and they're starting to pull the Marines out. Uh, there were you know, about 940 graves there. Um, it would eventually, by the end of the war, uh, the health consolidations have over 3,000 people will be buried here. Um, and until mid-September, uh, one thing that surprised me is during the research for this book, all remains were identified when they were buried. So this system clearly was working very well. Um, that is, all remains that were returned to the cemetery were identified. Not everyone was, and we'll get into that. Um, Marines also did not have a dedicated graves registration officer. This is Captain Richard Tonus. He was in charge of the MP company. Um, after the Battle of the Ridge in mid-September, uh, the Marines had such an influx of dead, they said, all right, we need somebody to be in charge of this. Um, this is his description of dealing with that. After each battle, the dead would be brought to the burial ground where the MPs had Koreans dig the number of graves needed. The battle lasted for a number of days. The bodies would become bloated, often with their helmets still on. Due to the swelling and condition of the body, it smelled bad enough to knock you over. I had two Navy corpsmen whose job it was to identify each Marine brought in. I also used a Navy dentist to record the teeth in the event their name tag was missing. The Japanese usually took the name tags as souvenirs. When a body came in from the front line, unrecognizable and without identification, the dentist would make a complete examination of his teeth so the body could possibly be identified at a much later date. I'm sure it was in instances such as these, the dentist wished he had chosen another profession. So... Uh -uh. So eventually the army moves in. Um, there were at least two uh, graves registration officers active um, during the Battle Canal campaign, uh, uh, Lieutenant Panosian and then Lieutenant Goodwin, who also was picked out of a quartermaster unit, had no formal graves registration training. He collected maybe a group of eight volunteers and they became the first uh, field trained graves registration section um, in the South Pacific. And they were in charge of operating the cemetery um, until I think uh, mid-1943, um, but his, uh, Goodwin's main, big claim to fame is not only he organized, ran the entire thing, um, but he would correspond with families uh, of the dead. He had to go back, he had to retroactively make um, make records because when the Marines shipped out they hadn't kept very complete ones or they were lost. Um, and so Goodwin was really did, did a lot of work uh, to make sure that he could match records up, that he could get in touch with families, let them know what had happened to their to their loved ones. Um, and the cemetery became a big, uh, I don't want to say tourist attraction, but it was it was a, it was a landmark uh, on Guadalcanal. So um, men staging through there later in the war, Guadalcanal became a giant base, um, would stop in and they would take a look. They would go looking for buddies, or they would just kind of pause to paused to pay their respects. Um, it was known as it was known as Guadalcanal Street. Um, I'm not sure if that was the name that the uh, the servicemen used or if that was a, a press one. Um, but what I like about this quote, the simple yet deeply felt epitaph supported them by their peers in danger and devotion. Um, I have just a, three examples of what those look like. So these are some of the handmade graves um, on Guadalcanal. Um, Private Almeida. Um, nickname was Punchy. Um, his friends did this carving of him. Um, Bill Cameron. Um, it's hard to see in this picture, but this is that famous line, when I get to heaven to St. Peter, he will tell another Marine reporting, sir, I've served my time in hell. Um, and they've got the stock of his, Cameron was killed in a bombing attack um, while on a working party along with 10 other men. So they painted up his rifle stock. Up here, you can see sort of the variety of graves, um, a little bit difficult to see, but the one in the front, this is made of shell casings that have been welded together. Behind it, there's a palm tree that's a stump that's been cut in half. There's a propeller in the back, which you know, uh, indicates air crew. 
Um, some, you know, some concrete stumps have been poured. Um, so these, you know, they really got into marking these, marking these grapes and taking care of them. And so, if it's if it's different types of grapes, Jeffrey, does that mean it's kind of the friends of the guy doing it, and what who yeah. who have they can wangle mm -hmm. in to help? If I happen to know an yeah. engineer who can mix cement, they can do that. If not, they chop down a bit of tree, and it's all done by what the buddies can find. It's yeah, amazing. it's mm -hmm. yeah, and you can like in some cases, there's a couple. There are multiple markers. Um, some that are regulation, like the ones in the front are regulation ones, but they would they. Guys would come through and they would decorate them, and it's it's interesting to look through you know, pictures of the cemetery overall, um, and you could see, um, you know, somebody was a machine gunner because they would have belted, you know, belted machine gun bullets along there, or uh, somebody was, you know, was a navy man, or somebody was in the artillery because somebody put a you know, five five inch shell casing at the edge of his grave. Um, it's very really interesting to sort of see. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is what it looked like between 1943 and 45. This is the same, this is the exact same location, um, Lieutenant Terrell uh, in that first grave. And so this is after professional um, graves registration units trained came in here and it was tended to um, by service units. There's a contingent of New Zealanders, I believe, who were um, also, in tra also charged with uh, taking care of the cemetery and guarding it. Um, and the local population as well um, did a lot of the maintenance and upkeep and really made it beautiful, had a big chapel, all that sort of stuff. And just a question about, so you're, you're saying that there's now starting to be this arrival of trained graves registration uh, personnel. Yes. Mm -hmm. did, you may not know the answer to this, but I, I, I bet you do. Did, did there, was there, was some of the experiences of what these guys have been doing in the field sent back to help train the people being trained or were they developing their own techniques separately or was that they were so they were starting to develop it separately um the uh the army um, don't quote me on this date but i believe they they started spooling up their graves registration um training in 1942 probably late in 1941 definitely in early 1942 um, they were using that manual as a guideline, so they were receiving yeah. the basics, and they were sending they were sending uh, units to Africa. They were preparing units to go to Europe, and they started sending units uh, to the um, to the Pacific as well. Um, well there's a certain amount of collaboration between nations mm -hmm. as well. And by this time, the Americans have certainly been working alongside Australians, New Zealanders, yes. Brits, and that. So there's that because there, mm -hmm. there's the theater differences that are going to affect things that the, the process in in north africa would, would involve different criteria than the process mm -hmm. in south pacific because of conditions ground disease those things so, so and i'm just yeah. i'm really glad you're here and thank you dave and his mm -hmm. watchers because it's just a subject that i realize i should know more about and i realize it's been on the periphery of so much i've been talking about myself in my career for 20 years but i've never mm -hmm. really dealt into that the, the whole practice behind this so, so again thank you for joining us yeah no abs absolutely um so yes yeah, so a lot of a lot of the graves registration units that would start um that would go on to serve later in the pacific would come to guadalcanal and that would be sort of they that would be like their field training area they would see the cemetery they would study records occasionally they would find bodies out in the boondocks and then they would send the graves registration trips out to get them bring them in try to do the ids and bury them um and of course this is an active military base People are, you know, people are getting killed quite frequently, um, just in operational accidents. So it's sort of like intro to then going on into combat. Um, so I'm going to go through real quick. These are a couple aerial pictures of the cemetery as it grew. So here it is in November '42, right at the very center. Uh, this is not. No, no, I put the wrong date in there. Um, this is, I think, in 1944. So you can see there's a camp that's been built down there. The cemetery's gotten quite a bit bigger. And then this is after the war in 1947. Um, you can see the the three sections. The one that's kind of squared off is the original, and then it grew out from there. So <clears throat> since we're meant to be talking about the missing and the unidentified, these are field graves. Um, this is what happened when you couldn't bring your buddy back um, and you had time uh, to bury him or battlefield conditions permitted. Um, the one on the left is a army, um, army temporary grave near Hill 27. The one on the right is is Marine or soldier. Um, the tag says here knows here knows, lies unknown Marine or soldier known much to God. Um, I have a hunch this might be a member of the Eighth Marines because he's got that older style helmet on there. Um, but I, I don't know exactly where the picture was taken, so I can't be 100 percent sure. Um, you can imagine uh, after a very brief period of time what might happen to 
small markers like these they're going to get knocked over they're going to get um, hit by artillery shells a lot of the areas um, where the most missing occurred were heavily heavily fought over um, north coast of Guadalcanal in particular um, some people say it looked like no man's land in World War I um, you know certainly very far from a you know, beautiful jungle landscape um, the army did a particularly good job of setting up these field burials. Um, they were under orders not to, for a while, not to bring their dead back um, because the, um, one of the generals felt that too much time and attention was being uh, spent on the dead and not enough care given to the wounded. Um, so a lot, more of the, a lot more of the army graves were brought back. Also, by the time the, Mar by the, time the army was f closing out that campaign, most of the Marine units had pulled back. They didn't leave any records of where their burials in the field had occurred for the army. So Marines, uh, army army soldiers who fell in the field were found more often deliberately. Marines and uh, Marines were more often found by chance, it seems. And I guess just to bring it, we had Darren Little, whose grandfather was with the British commandos and numerous other units, he's talking about the fact that not only are these Allied graves going to be lost, trampled, just, uh, mm -hmm. broken over, blown up, there's enemy dead. Where there's where there's there's friendly dead. There's going to be enemy dead. So the enemy dead yes. are going to get involved in sort of contaminating, in a sense, the, the the crime scene, so to speak. So was there any kind of policy to for the for the for Marines to try and tidy up the enemy dead, if if for no other reason to keep them away from their own dead? It's very much a question of sanitation, battlefield sanitation. Um, there was a very small. Cemetery, uh, auxiliary cemetery on Guadalcanal, which was for um, Japanese prisoners. Um, so if they had any POWs, any POWs who passed who died uh, on the island were buried um, in their own in their own area. Wow. Other places, um, there are a lot of accounts of just digging digging on on Tulagi. They dragged Japanese bodies to a knockdown building and then set the whole thing on fire. Um, uh, after after Alligator Creek, they dug just big trenches and pushed them in. They had they had, PO, they had POWs just throwing them in. Um, there's, I think, um, an instance after the Battle of Henderson Field where they talk about gathering uh, Japanese troops together and setting, you know, dynamite charges to knock down the top of a cliff and bury them that way. So there's absolutely no attempt to uh, individually bury or otherwise sort of, you know, treat treat Japanese remains as anything more than, I'm sorry to say, but, but rotting meat that needs to be uh, dealt with. Yeah, um, health. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it, it's a lot of flies. That's one of the considerations in the manual. It says, yep, San yeah. sanitation of the battlefield. And it's, uh, it's, it's a tough thing to think about today, but that was, that was, the, that was the SOP. So there are probably, there are probably Marine Amer and American remains that were intermingled in there. Um, and we have no idea where they are, so. Anyway, I, I'm sorry for asking you questions. It's just the, no, the, absolutely. It's good. The viewer is interested, so I'll, I'll let mm -hmm. you get back to the slide. Sure. <laughs> no, no, please, no, please, please, please do. I will. I will ramble about this until everybody is dead from boredom. Um, okay. So when you had a casualty in the field, you had a couple methods of identification readily available. Um, first and foremost, you've got the identification tags. The one shown here uh, was recovered from the site of a wildcat um, crash in 1942. Uh, pilot's name was Bailey. He was recovered and identified in 2017. Um, so you can see his tag survived not only the crash of his airplane, but all those intervening years. So if you can find a tag, that was usually a pretty good indication you found the right person. Um, in the middle, uh, when a body was recovered, they would take an inventory of all the personal effects on there. So Frederick Secor, who was killed in uh, September of 42 while serving with the 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, uh, all he had on him was a package of letters and pictures, but they were able to identify where he was at the time, but he wound up buried in the field, was not recovered later. Um, and then on the right, these are two sets of uh, inventory. The one on top, Bollington the same individual, the one on top is what he had on him at the time of death. And the one on the bottom is what was found in his uh, in his bags or in his, in his belongings um, in the rear area. Uh, so you'll have instances where families are sent collections of things that were found in the, found, um, you know, in sea bags or in trunks or in camp um, are sent them and said, well, you have his belongings. What do you mean you can't find his body? And so it's a, it's a distinction that the, the, um, the services were not very careful in, in making. Um, so you had somebody who just flat out disappeared. There's no, there's nothing on them. Um, next step was to take fingerprints. Everybody had their fingerprints taken when they were, and they entered the service along with the physical description. Um, 
And this was done, you know, first of all, so if you had committed any crimes, the FBI could be notified because they were big into fingerprinting at the time. Um, and secondly, if you were killed and you didn't have other methods and you could be fingerprinted, um, they would do postmortem ones. Um, the prints here, the picture on the top, I couldn't find one of them doing this on uh, Guadalcanal, but this is one from Iwo Jima um, doing fingerprinting a, a corpse here. The one below, these are actual fingerprints from a, from a Guadalcanal unknown. Um, who died of wounds uh, at Spiritu Santo. Um, not very good ones, unfortunately. Um, so they were unable to match them. He's still unidentified. This wound up being uh, extremely helpful during the war because they would send off these sets of prints um, back to headquarters Marine Corps, and they would then match them against the service records of anybody who's reported missing. And they would say, oh, okay, well, X-13 has got the same prints as private student. When did private student, when did private student go missing? Oh, he went missing here. Where is, you know, where is he buried? Okay, we've got this, we've got this unknown who is buried with other members of his company. And that was a pretty good indication that you had the right guy. Um, so a lot of the wartime identification, postmortem identifications were made by comparing these records and they were later verified after the war with, uh, with a fairly, fairly high degree of accuracy. So this wound up being a really great, um, really great one. And uh, should you have, this is one of the fingerprinting kits. So you see, they've got everything you need right in there. And this was used by a graves registration unit. Yeah. We, we do like it when a guest has props as well. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, I've got all, I got all kinds of stuff. Um, <clears throat> and then this is the last one. This is These are dental charts. Um, again, these were taken well, when you went into the service. Um, the first four here um, are... Uh, Guadalcanal casualties. The last one's actually a, uh, a Tarawa casualty who was identified later. Um, so these were taken, they're, they're marked up, and as you had additional dental work done during the course of your service, you were supposed to, this chart was supposed to be updated by, you know, by the medical officer. This was not to be taken out of your health record for any, any circumstances. Unfortunately, they sometimes were, or they just, the, the, the record keeping was not as good as it should be. So it was not always the most reliable way to do that because if you said, oh, well, so-and-so is missing a tooth here, but he's got a cavity over here, I guess it's not a, guess it's not a perfect match. Um, as you can see over here, Pellerito uh, from Tarawa, he's got, a, he's got pretty close dental, but a forensic uh, odontologist looking at that would say this is, this is not quite enough to be a 100% to be match and they would, dis they would uh, disapprove an identification if there was any sort of discrepancy. So, well, that said, goodness, we can get into case studies. So a couple of events where um, they had Marines, lar larger numbers of Marines who are missing, not accounted for. An interesting um, characteristic of the Battle of Guadalcanal was largely Marines largely fought within a perimeter um, and would send out combat patrols uh, to sort of you know, harass and interdict the enemy, uh, find out what they were planning, what they were doing, um, and occasionally would mount larger offensives, um, but a lot of uh, a lot of the casualties were sustained while they were in a perimeter setting. And by and large, those casualties were brought to the cemetery were identified. Uh, it's when you had troops operating beyond the perimeter out in the jungle that you started to run into these problems, which makes sense when you think about it, because the number of the number of people it takes to carry back one wounded person uh, you have six or eight people trying to carry one wounded man. Um, Big big manpower drain. So you're not always going to be able to bring back your uh, bring back your dead. Hence the field burials. Um, excuse me. So the first big uh, big instance of uh, non recovered is the Getchi Patrol, which is one of the most famous um, parts of the uh, parts of the campaign. Uh, was brought to life in uh, the Guadalcanal Diary. Um, quite a famous scene and. Um, Dave's done some really great uh, presentations work on that. And definitely check out his. Check out Dave's channel, and um, you'll you'll see yeah, yeah, some, some really phenomenal I'll stuff. Mm -hmm. I'll add the link later, folks, to Dave's walking the battlefield Guadalcanal uh, channel. Yeah, um, really add that after the show is finished. But yeah, brilliant stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so, short overview: the Getchy Patrol. This was um, undertaken by um, Colonel Frank Getchy, who was the Division Intelligence Officer or D two. Um, he was in charge of um, you know finding out what the enemy was doing at all times. Um, he uh, was under a bit of a cloud at the beginning of the campaign because they were they had 
no idea really how many Japanese were on the island. Um, he had anticipated there being something like 5,000 ready to meet them at the beaches, and then the Marines come ashore with no casualties, and so everybody's saying, well, Frank, uh, what happened there? So he's trying to, he's really trying hard to kind of win back a little bit of his, you know, his reputation. He doesn't have a lot of experience as an intelligence officer. He has some um, from the 1920s, but like a lot of guys in intelligence, this was not one of the special, this is not one of the eight specialty schools the Marines had in operation was, it was intelligence. They were also, they, they were also kind of winging it. Um, they learned a lot, but that's a, that's an entirely different conversation. So Colonel Getchy decides he's going to take a patrol out um, to go investigate uh, reports of a Japanese group that's preparing to surrender. He's learned this from a, uh, from a POW. Um, he gathers, you know, his best and brightest. These are the guys from his D2 section. Um, all really fascinating guys. Custer in particular uh, is actually a uh, distant descendant of George Armstrong. Um, really fat, really fascinating guy. Uh, he's the, the top kick of the, uh, um, the division intelligence section. And then he went and brought, um, the, the R2 regimental section of the 5th Marines, another bunch of really experienced guys and very senior folks, um, including Ralph Corey, who was one of the maybe four uh, Japanese-speaking Marines um, on the entire island and one of two who could uh, who was fluent. Um, so they brought him along to do interrogations, which uh, was wound up being a terrible idea. Um, and then the balance of these guys are much more junior. Um, they're in action for the first time. Um, but the problem is these guys are all specialists. They don't have, um, you know, they're, they are, they're all trained, they're all trained to use weapons, but that's not their primary specialty. Getchy, re Getchy replaced a bunch of riflemen and sent out all of these specialists intending this was going to be this big intelligence coup. Um, he also sends, um, the surgeon of the fifth Marines, the senior medical officer of the regiment, uh, who had won the Navy cross in the first world war. So to give you an idea of sort of what that looks like. Everybody here in bold is going on the patrol. Everybody here who's red and crossed out was killed. So you can see this absolutely, this absolutely decapitated um, the R2 section of the 5th Marines and put a major damper on the activities of um, the division. These guys went out, they got stuck on it. They landed too soon. It was, it was called an intelligence comedy of errors. They landed in the wrong place at the wrong time in the middle of a group of Japanese who were very much looking for a fight. Uh, Getchi went down first. Three men managed to make it back. The rest were caught within a perimeter that gradually shrank as the night went on. Um, this platoon sergeant, Few, was the last one to leave. He swam to safety and he said he turned back and he could see bayonets flashing in the sun, bayonets and sabers flashing in the sun as the men were mutilated. Officially, um, in you know, early histories of the battle, um, even in General Vandergriff's own memoir, he says nothing was ever found of, their, of this patrol. They, they said they, they had essentially vanished. Nobody could go, find, nobody could find them. Um, but we know from other veterans' accounts, this is not the case, and that these mutilated remains were found and were, were, were remarked upon uh, frequently uh, in the next couple of, uh, the next several days. Actually, they went, they, they staged a, um, an attack on the village of Harahi, uh, which became uh, called the first battle of the Matanakau, uh, about a week later. Um, one of the objectives was to try to retrieve these bodies and bring them back, um, but they were unable to because they had to. They wound up getting recalled back to the perimeter. Um, and this area was later. Um, so there was maybe one of them. Purple Bainbridge was found, was buried individually, but the grave, the grave marker, if there was one, was long since destroyed. And the rest of these guys have long, have you know have just basically vanished, and there's or the remains of them, I should say, have been vanished or washed, probably washed to sea, um, or yeah, or just so badly scattered. It's really it's frustrated every attempt to try and find them. There have been several. Um, the second case, uh, there was a fight along the Lunga River in mid September. This after the Getchi patrol was probably the biggest patrol failure that the First Marine Division experienced. Um, uh, Company B, 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, um, was sent up up the river uh, in the aftermath of the Battle of the Ridge to try and find out where the Japanese had gone to. Um, they were led by an inexperienced captain who had his men, instead of moving through the jungle, had them go up along the dry riverbed. They walked into an ambush of six machine guns caught in a crossfire that, that cut off their first platoon. 
and a machine gun section attached to it. They fought for several hours trying to get these guys out of there. Uh, division ordered them to withdraw and basically left um, left the remainder of these guys to their fate. And um, the 25 were missing at first, and um, some of them made it back on their own over the next couple of days, um, but the rest were killed. This location, um, we actually, they, these Marines went back to try to do the, you know, the burial by organizations. Um, they found their, but they found almost all of them. Uh, one private had, you know, was had, could not could not be located. Um, they found them. They buried them in the configuration you see over here uh, at the far right. Um, the names in, uh, the names in white were later identified. The names in black have not been. Um, but this is an interesting case because all of them were buried in 42 by their friends identified. And um, in 1944, they were found, they actually reported to Graves Registration in 1944 and Graves Registration came out, recovered some of them, but not all of them. So there are still eight out there. Um, not entirely sure why. There aren't any unknowns in the cemetery that would have been buried around that time that would match. So we we're pretty sure that these guys are still, uh, still out in the field. Um, this is an interesting one. This site, we believe, has been uh, located by DPA, and they're, they're undergoing um, uh, recovery operations there, um, or at least one of them, Hill X or Hill Y. Um, it's Chesty Puller led a combat patrol out into the boondocks trying to get around the flank of Japanese positions on the Matanikau River. Um, his lead elements found a, uh, a Japanese campsite, again, guarded you know, with the rear guard, you know, armed heavily with machine guns. Um, they fought in two, you know, fought, fought a pretty sharp battle um, on the 24th of September, lost five guys killed outright and five more died of their wounds later on. Um, this case is, uh, they did these quite detailed map overlays, which were included in service records. They're done on um, very thin paper, so you can lay them over a, uh, lay them over a map. Um, however, Puller was using a, uh, a different map than what was standard. Um, I personally have not ever been able to find a copy of this map, and from reading post-war search accounts, it sounds like they weren't either. They were trying to use these uh, coordinates based on the standard map, but of course they didn't. They didn't match. Um, mm -hmm. So these two sites were these two sites were later lost. They were about 300 yards apart. Um, Hill Y was where uh, I believe they they buried the guys who were killed outright. Hill X was where closer to where they set up their night position. Um, so there were 10, uh, that's 10 more Marines. Again, and Puller had so many men wounded, uh, he had to detach, uh, basically he detached two of his, two of his three companies um, to escort the wounded back and uh, carried on his mission um, with his company C and I think second battalion, fifth Marines. And they went on to you know, fight later in the second battle, the Botanicau. Um, those two companies, uh, unfortunately, did not catch a break. And a few days later, they were involved in one of the worst defeats um, the Marines suffered. Uh, it's known as the Battle of Little Dunkirk. Um, and they lost an additional 16 uh, men who were who have not been recovered. That's all right in that same area. And then finally, I'm going to be cognizant of, our, cognizant of our time and attention here. One last example, um, which I talk about this one in, in, the, uh, in the book um, as well. But I wanted to bring it up here. Um, you had officers who were in charge of taking down map coordinates um, or otherwise noting when their men were um, when their men were killed. What you're seeing is a uh, close-up of map 104. That's a 1,000 yard grid. Um, you can even see like on this scan that uh, the lines aren't you know perfectly straight. Um, it's it's very very rough. There's there's very little in the way of you know terrain marks. There are sections of this. There are aerial photographs just show clouds. Um, so it just says cloud on the map. They have no idea what's under it. Um, and the first two men, uh, this is a two-day operation um, done by the 8th Marines with support of the Army. Um, I should, well, I was just say they were, they were supporting the Army. Um, the first two men who were killed, uh, Sergeant Smith and Corporal Asher, um, were somewhere in the vicinity of Point Cruz at the time. But when their when their map coordinates were taken, the officer was off just a little bit, and he placed them out here. And this is the water. This is Iron Bottom Sand over here. So um, when search teams came to find them, uh, 
they wrote this, this really quite snarky note in their mission report said, well, uh, as these coordinates are three to 500 yards out in the bay, we determined that recovery is impossible. So mm -hmm. um, these two are probably still out there. Uh, Schultheis number three um, was in an isolated grave. He's still out there. Um, Annen and Schlesinger were later recovered. Annen was mistaken for an, uh, for an army private and uh, well, they, they, only in 1948, I think, when they were fine, doing final processing of remains, they found his dog tag uh, mixed in there and determined that he was actually he was actually a Marine and not a soldier. Um, so this brings us to the post-war era um, and the expeditions to retrieve the missing. So there was a program um, after the war uh, to bring home everybody. Um, it was kind of debated. No, no remains were brought home during the war. Uh, priority had to be given to transport for supplies, for reinforcements, for bringing, you know, bringing things to the living. Standard naval policy, inter the bodies near where they fell. Um, <clears throat> the 604th Quartermaster Graves Registration Company um, was probably the most experienced unit uh, in the theater, and they wound up spearheading two expeditions. Um, between 1947 and 1949, um, specifically out looking uh, for these isolated burials, out looking for crash sites. Uh, there were separate units that went to go disinter remains from cemeteries. Um, they did not meet with as much success as they thought they would. It was not, it was far from a popular assignment. Um, they often had uh, troops would desert sometimes if they found that they were gonna have to go do Graves registration officers would resign their brand new officers would resign their commissions um, wow. rather than go tramp around the islands um, in the years after the war and go search for search for skeletons. Not a popular assignment um, and made markedly more difficult by how much the train had changed um, in the few scant years since the war. One of the observers who went with was a Guadalcanal veteran. And at one point he remarked this, like, if you hadn't told me I was standing along the banks of the Matanica, I would not have known it. Um, so you can imagine the difficulty in trying to find something so small as an individual grave marker when you've got a vague set of instructions, potentially the wrong map, um, or just say, oh, we were last seen between this river and this river. Yeah, well, that's a distance of 500 yards. Um, mm -hmm. where, do, where, where, do you, where do you even begin? Um, it's interesting you said that about officers maybe resigning their commission because it, it reminds me of that thing where you know, people say, oh, yes, we all we all want wind turbines, but we don't want them in our backyards. And it, I can imagine if you asked most serving military in the late, late 90s, do you think all our war dead should be recovered and brought back? They universally <laughs> say yes. But yeah. if they're asked for it themselves, oh, well, no, I would, I would hope really someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was um, there's a quote from a, a soldier who had to go dig up one of the remains of some of his friends. Uh, on Guadalcanal, who he had personally buried, he was chosen to go back out there because he knew where they were and he knew he knew who they were. And he said, by the time they dug them up, all they could, they, would, they had been there two weeks or three weeks, um, and it was just, he said, it was like it was like digging in soup. He said, we made, we got out the long bones and that's about it. He said, he said, I don't regret doing it, and if, if like I, I knew they would have done it for me, he said, but I would he said, I would never do that again. That's somebody that's somebody who had a vested interest in bringing back a friend. You know, imagine spending, you know, spending you know, six months on a LST, going from island to island, looking for looking for these remains. And, right. and the other thing you're doing, I think, I think everyone watching would agree, is that people are familiar with some of these patrols, the the, the, the puller one mm -hmm. and what have you. But we probably read about them in terms of whether or not they succeeded what in what they were supposed to militarily. Did they find the enemy? Mm -hmm. Did they not? Were, were they well planned? Were they badly planned? But I think when we've read these accounts before, I'm speaking for myself, and it says 20 lost, 10 lost, 10, 10 didn't come back. You kind of, you take that on board for a second and go, oh, that's very tragic. And then you move on to the next explanation. But the, what you're mm -hmm. doing is reminding us is that, that the, the human tragedy of a simple error in transcribing of coordinates means they don't know where to look for yeah. these missing people. Yeah. See, I think yeah. everybody's having the same reaction with this show is they're realizing it's something that they haven't really thought about. Yeah. There's actually that that quote from that note about B18 um, is in Dean Ladd's autobiography, um, and he note he specifically says the officer in charge of doing that was the executive officer John Murdoch, and he said Murdoch, it's, I'm gonna, 
paraphrasing here, but he said Murdoch was he was sweating over these details because he knew if he screwed them up, that that would that could mean the difference between somebody coming home and somebody not. And yeah. the rest of Murdoch's coordinates for the rest of there are bang on. And uh, those were, I think those were the first two he had to do. They were the first two killed from that company. Um, and so it's it just feels like extra tragic knowing that this this officer was doing his level best, but you know maybe his maybe his map grid was just had just been nudged by an inch or so, and he was just yeah. and he was tracing the wrong spot. It's it's hard it's hard to say, um, but yeah, it, those little those little those little moments you never know. So, looking at sort of where we're standing today, um, this is the total Marine Corps Navy casualties. Uh, Navy attached Marines don't have um, their own medical service. Um, so the, the Navy provides corpsmen to Marine units. They are integrated fully into those units, um, as I'm sure devil docks. Um, so that's what this is counting. The number of those who are identified at their time of burial, 833, 31 were buried at sea. Identified uh, between 1946 and 1950, so the immediate post-war period is 92. 1950, the present, 10, and I actually have to update this to 11 because just last night, uh, DPA announced that they have identified um, Second Lieutenant Gordon Thompson, uh, a Marine pilot lost um, due to oxygen failure over Guadalcanal. So that was a nice, nice, nice way to uh, get started today. Um, and so then we still have unidentified. We'll be now 384 um, by my calculation. And again, this is purely Marine and attached Navy. Um, I don't have a similar data set for the Army. I would love to. Um, and for the Navy, the number is in the thousands. Um, mm -hmm. of identified because we've got so many who just went down with ships and were never, were never found. So I just want to sort of round out today. Um, I don't, I, I don't go out in the field myself. I do the, I do the background research. Um, <clears throat> I dig through records. I look for stories. I try to draw these connections. Um, I use those to support organizations that do go out into the field. Um, History Flight being a big example. Um, I, know, I, do, I do some liaison work with the DPAA. Um, but if this is something that sparks interest for any of the viewers, I want to give you kind of an idea of how you can use records and influ records and um, readily available information to build a compelling case um, without having to go out with a metal detector or a cadaver dog uh, or tromp through the bone house. <clears throat> so this is X94 on Guadalcanal. <clears throat> Sorry, I have to look at my larger version of this. So these are three of the most important documents you're going to find. This is all contained in what's called the Individual Deceased Personnel File, IDPF. The first is a report of interment. This was taken in 1944. Um, these vary in how detailed they are. Um, in some cases, it just says, well, you know, person, you know, unknown, you know, cause of death unknown, location where found unknown. Um, then you have to start someplace else. This one, we're quite fortunate that they put, this is was done by a very, you know, by a trained graves registration unit. So they put in the pertinent data. Um, he was buried. They don't know when he was killed, but he was buried on May 16th, 1944. Um, they did not find any, um, no identifying marks on his body, no identifying tags. He was, was, by this point, he was bones. But they do note body disinterred from isolated burial, 16th May 1944. No tags or cross on, on or <clears throat> no tags on cross or body. Size of shoes nine and a half. So they did find a pair of shoes. Tooth chart tooth chart taken and attached. Unknown body buried on left of Matelski and then a serial number. Body of R. C. Farrar buried on right of Matelski. All three graves in one row. Important clues there. Names of identified people who are nearby. Well, file that one away. Our next one, um, this is the quartermaster form 1044. Um, three in comes in three parts. This was done uh, in 1948. In this example, this was put, uh, done by the anthropologists who are examining these remains after the war and attempt to identify them. Um, they give you estimated height, estimated weight, color of hair if they know it at this point, none left, uh, possible age, race, any pertinent data and any effects found. So again, we see our, our fellow here. They can estimate him at 155 pounds. He's about five foot ten. Um, no hair remaining, so they're not sure. They said based on his uh, based on his uh, scaled makeup, they can determine he's probably Caucasian, and they can age him to about 20 to 24 years. 
Um, it's actually quite interesting, the, the whole story of how um, the Central Identification Laboratory got spun up in the years after the war. That's, a, that's another hour and a half long topic. Um, but they've got, um, it, it actually became the basis, Dr. Mildred Trotter, who was one of the lead uh, anthropologists there, uh, she went on to literally write the book um, in how to uh, how to identify um, remains from uh, basically from bones. How to identify a person or give a give a solid description from skeletal remains. She used this um, information. Um, she had thousands and thousands of guys to practice on. Um, the second one is a dental report. This again was done in 1948, so you have to account for there being some post mortem loss. Um, it gets this gets into more complicated territory, um, but you can see the um, anything that's got an X, they're indicating that that tooth was appears to have been extracted. A P with an X through it means it was uh, probably posthumously missing. Um, over here in the top left, you can see this section is missing, which may be due to uh, trauma. Um, and they make a you know note of like any drift, any feelings, any sort of thing. They're going to use this against dental charts, uh, like we saw in the previous slide. And then the last form uh, is the physiology. And this is where they show what parts of the skeleton were recovered, what parts weren't, and they notice any potential trauma or, and they give as much of a description as they can. This one, you can see our individual here has suffered some, uh, some trauma to his face. Looks like it could potentially be an entry and an exit wound. Um, although I don't, don't take my word 100% on that. It's what it appears from here. Um, but they can give a description of him, you know, picture a young man of musc average muscular build, um, and it gets into, you know, so you're, you're supposed to be able to draw an idea of what the face would look like. They would take this information, they, they would send this in sort of a double blind test, they would send this off to um, people who had photos of these individuals, and they would try to match, uh, match it based on a service record photo. If they could, then it would go back to dental. If they could do that, then it would go back to you know, the physiology, that sort of thing. And so they would have to go through this multiple step process to make sure that they made as few errors as possible. They did make mistakes, but this is, um, this is one of the examples of how they, uh, how they identified Auden correctly uh, in the end. He was going through this process and they, were, they had contacted these, the other soldier's family and said, hey, we have your son, where do you want us to send him for burial? And then in this final confirmation process, they said, oh, wait. And then they had to contact that family and say, we made a mistake. We actually don't know where your son is. But the Anand family was thrilled. The Doucette family was not. Wow. OK. So we've got all that information about X94. This fellow on the left is Albert Whitey Hermiston. Albert Hermiston was in the 2nd Raider Battalion. He participated in Carlson's Long Patrol. Um, he was killed in action um, in a skirmish at Mount Austin um, on the 4th of December, 1942, uh, literally within sight of the airfield. It was the, it was the very last day of the patrol. Um, they were hurrying a bit to get back because they had suffered some men wounded the previous day, um, and they were racing to get down the hill. Um, the book Bless Them All by Oscar Petros mentions what happened to Hermiston. On the point was Corporate Albert, Albert L. Hermiston's fire team with Private First Class Richard C. Farrar and Private, Private Stuyvesant Van Buren. When the point was about 100 yards down the trail on a stretch that was straight as an arrow, a perfect spot for an ambush, Hermiston suddenly gave the signal to hit the deck and simultaneously a Japanese machine gun opened fire. Hermiston and Farrar were killed instantly. And then later on, he describes the death of another Marine Batalski dropped with a shot between the eyes. So we've got also up here, this is a good primary source if you don't want to trust the recollections of uh, Oscar Petros, who was there and witnessed this event. Um, but this is an extract from Buster Roll. Albert Hermiston, temporary duty, Company B, fourth died of gunshot wounds in action against the enemy character exit remains interred in the field. So if you recall from that um, burial report, you've got Ferrar and Matelski and an unknown individual. Private Van Buren, by the way, was mortally wounded during this, and he managed to survive long enough to get back to the perimeter, um, jokingly asked his officer for a beer, and then died, and he was buried in the cemetery. Um, and another one of the wounded Marines, a Lieutenant Jack Miller, a very popular officer, was also killed, uh, also died of his wounds as they were heading back down. <clears throat> so if we were to take a look at some of Hermiston's information, the one on the left, this is a casualty card. Every Marine uh, killed, wounded, injured 
in an accident suffering from um, what was then called uh, battle fatigue, psychoneurosis, has one of these on file. Um, gives the pertinent information, as much info as they could get um, about the casualty. So here you can see it's not necessarily giving us too much, um, but does give a time of death, 720, that gels with what Petros was saying. And we say, all right, 4th December, buried adjoining government trail, Mambula, Guadalcanal. Mambula was another, uh, the, the local name from Mount Austin, Guadalcanal, Solomon Islands. See so sketch in his service records. A lot of the times these sketches were lost, as you can see down here, no sketch in service record. They look for it, but the sketch was gone from his service record by November, 1945, and there's no way to tell where that is. From his service record, we have, you recall this, these are his, his fingerprints and yep. a description of his physicality. Our last file over here, Quartermaster Form 371. These were issued um, for every uh, individual that the 604th or any other unit of that type was going out to look for. It gives as much information, again, as they could have. Usually pretty scanty, but what it does give us here, which is nice, is a rough version of the tooth chart. Not very detailed, but enough that you can look at it in the field and make an analysis. If you were to take the two together, um, these are not the X94 teeth, but this is to give you an idea of what they would look, what you know what they look like you know, today, looking at it post mortem. Um, there are several similarities aside from you know the coincidental um, stuff between X94 and Albert Hermiston. Um, there are similarities here at 14 and 13. Um, his molar number 16 uh, could potentially, as I say, might have been forced further into the jaw. The mandible's fractured, so they're not sure um, exactly what this you know. Uh, what's going on here. Um, 16 on the right says partially impacted, um, which could mean that it was just not visible uh, when he had his dental chart taken. So that's why it's listed as extracted over here. Um, there's been some damage, there's a filling, but unfortunately the teeth that are, the teeth that are present are fairly close, but there's been enough damage done to the remains um, that it's impossible to make a full, uh, or it was impossible at the time to make a full um, uh, comparison or full uh, um, identification after that. But if you compare the data, Hermiston was 22, six foot nine, weighed 153 Caucasians, buried along the government trail in Mambula. X94, estimated 22 to 24, probably about you know seven inches tall, 155 Caucasian. Isolated burial found with the Tarim and Matelski, who were also buried along government trail Mambula. This is a pretty, I want to caution everybody, this is not This is not me saying this is This is definitely Hermiston, but this is a pretty good argument, I think, backed up by data. Um, in order for this to progress, we would need to find a an appropriate biological relative of Albert Hermiston, have them submit a DNA sample, and um, basically start, start pinging a DPAA uh, to go exhume X94, who is currently buried in uh, Manila, I believe, under an unknown marker. So if we have those remains. It could be Hermiston. I hope um, I hope that we will uh, be able to get to the bottom of this for sure someday. Um, that's always the hope. So, but so, so one of the questions I was going to ask you, and it seems an appropriate time now, is of you know you started your website from correct me if I'm wrong, 2011. Yes, is that right. So, mm -hmm. you know, if even the decade plus you've been doing it, technology is improving all the time. The number of our, uh, re re records that digitalized is increasing yes. all the time. The, the number of people who are familiar with how to use those digital archives is increasing all the time. The families are beginning to understand that these things are possible. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, the war is well in the past, but we maybe are only at the beginning, really, of this process of, of, of tying these stories together. You know, you're, you're mm -hmm. one person, and we'll get to how people can, can help with your project in a minute. But, I mean, it, it, the, the technology revolution, and it's not going to end. It's going to get better, isn't it, I assume? Yep. Absolutely. And um, I'm just, just from my perspective as a researcher, when I started... Um, I, mean, I didn't really know what I was getting into. <laughs> I thought I would be done with it within within three years, and I'm still uh, I'm only up through. I've got I have individual profiles up for everybody through the end of 1943, which is about half of uh, half of the total. Um, so I'll probably be doing this for at least another ten years, I guess. Um, but yeah, I would not be able to do um, 
half the work that I have done without you know the, the access that we have uh, these days. Um, I mean, I'm, I use I have an ancestry account, full three account, newspapers account, um, several other ones. Uh, I have a really phenomenal. Been very lucky to partner up with some really great researchers who are also working in this area, and we trade documents and information as much as we can. Um, but yeah, without that, um, without that, the technology you know, the connection, it would be sifting through page after page after page um, in the archives. Which don't get me wrong, I love to do that too, but. Uh, you would not be able to do it anywhere near um, as rapidly. Um, and definitely the people who did start that, it's sort of a standing on the shoulders of giants uh, moment. Because a lot, a lot of people got in there and did a lot of groundwork. Um, and we're just, Obviously, uh, we're just trying, to, to trying, to carry, trying to carry the torch forward. Yeah, as I said, the link to your website is always in the description mm -hmm. below and uh, they can find out more details. But I know, you know, you're, you're, not, you're not here to sort of self-promote and, and say, look at me, I'm good. But, you know, just... I'm yep. putting on a spot now. In in the in the eleven years you've been working, you know, you in you personally, how many cases have you have you seen through? Um, I've contributed to I don't know, maybe a, a probably maybe a dozen um, like that. Um, I'd say the two that sort of hit hit the closest were very recent. They were this year. Um, Willie Bragsdale and Arthur Irvin, who was my the the Marine who really started the entire thing. Um, back in 2011, um, they were the three guys from First Battalion, 24th Marines, who were unaccounted for all from Second. Uh, I started working with a guy named Ted Darcy, uh, who has a group called WFI Research Organization. Um, showed him the information that I gained from talking about veterans. And he had a big stockpile of these records. And he said, oh, he's like, I can tell you exactly where those guys are. Said, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so he, he shared me that info. And over the years, we kept trying to build and build and build and build these cases. Um, and it's very difficult to get traction on these. Very, very difficult. Um, and finally, um, Ragsdale, Ragsdale sort of spun off out of my control, but um, I'm very proud of the fact that I was able to get in touch with Irvin's family, um, get them to uh, help help them identify the, the, a person, the right person in their family tree who would be able to send in a DNA sample, and he actually did it. And as soon as he did, about two weeks later, in you know, June this year, they said he was identified and wouldn't you know what Ragsdale and Irvin were both right exactly where uh, Ted and I said that they were 11 years ago. Um, it's a shame it wow. took this long. Um, so I was trying to trying to get that done for a very dear veteran friend of mine um, who served with with Irvin and for his half sister, who's the last surviving member of his family who remembered him. Um, and unfortunately, they both passed away um, just in the last couple of years. So we weren't able to weren't able to to get it done on time, but at least we've got it for the uh, the surviving members of his family. Um, yeah, and on to the on to the next one. Yeah, and I think one one more slide have you got to, to show? I think one more. Oh yeah, this is just the uh, just my wrap up slide. Um, this is a picture of a Marine's grave um, on Guadalcanal, taken in January '43. Say, here lies a devil dog. Um, see what's left of his. His M1 is up top there. If his or somebody's, a lot of the Marines were carrying the, the O3. Um, not sure when this was taken or where. Um, or I'm sorry, it's well, it's early 1943 by a 2nd Division photographer. Um, I've always wondered if this Marine was later found um, or if his was one of the graves, as it's, it's quite close to the water. You know, was this washed away in a few months? And he's one of the guys who's, who's still on my list. Um, you know, we'll never know about. So, well, so well, image to carry with us so far, and uh, I'll I'll mm -hmm. just bring it back to me and you on screen there. So, the the the, the question now, you know, the, the, we have a bit of a reach here on the channel. So, what what can people do to help you? What what what? Where are you now in this process? What can people do to help? What are your aims? Um, honestly, if you know anybody um, who has an MIA in their family. 
um, reach out to them, encourage them to contact DPAA to learn as much as they can about um, about their service member. You can always send me an email. I'll be glad to help or put you in touch with uh, people who can. Uh, if I have records, I'll send them to you. I may not, but I uh, can potentially help you get them. Um, is the only thing that's really going to bring uh, the World War II set home anymore is um, so much more much more direct action, um, especially for some of these field, some of these field cases where uh, it's it's very expensive to get out there, um, and uh, it's just it's a lot more challenging. But having family involved um, with those those DNA samples, that's the most that's the most important thing that I can ask you to do. Um, donate to groups like History of Flight um, who are actually putting on these um, these on the ground uh, expeditions. Um, you know, they started uh, their founder started paying it out of his own pocket, and they can certainly use the uh, certainly use the extra help um, so they start spinning back up their operations uh, after after COVID. Um, yeah, and I think that's 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 mostly it. Network and um, just. You know, learn as much as you can. Find find somebody near your hometown. Um, if it's if it's of interest, I have two maps up on up on the site that show the home addresses of uh, every K um, uh, Marine and Navy corpsman from both the Guadalcanal and the Tarawa campaigns. Find somebody. Find the closest one near your hometown. Learn about them, um, and just keep uh, keep remembering them as individuals and not uh, not just faces, names, and statistics or you know, unsolved mysteries. Um, that's what you should. Uh, I think that's probably that's probably best. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. There's that. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase again. There's that quote. You know, you never you you die two times. Right? The first time is when you're when you're killed, and the second time is when the last person says your name. Um, yeah. No, it, it, you reminded me that I went to a a, a film pre premiere here in Normandy in June. Uh, a friend of ours, Florent Planner, who has interviewed veterans, and he's got a new film, a documentary film coming out about. Uh, three uh, fallen on Omaha Beach, and he's calling it that. You, 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 you only, you, you can only, you can potentially die twice. You die physically the first time, and then you die when when no one is talking about you anymore. And his intention is to keep these three fallen people in people's consciousness. And I think that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, we. That's why I think it was this 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 show was so important. You know, where there are people like Sol David, James Holland, Peter Caddick Adams, all these others squirreling away, bringing us the history, the analysis, and an analysis of what the battles were, the leadership, the, the, that. But this, the, we, we're going back to what we said right at the beginning. If you if you are a family who has someone missing in that conflict, it, it can never be resolved. No amount of analysing about the battle, and, and and apportioning blame or saying we now know where this, you know, this campaign went wrong. It was this decision here made on the, so that that's irrelevant if you've still got someone missing in it. So it's important. And of course. They can buy your book, Leaving Matt uh, Behind, and 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 that's available in a good bookshop. There's a link below, and obviously they can help by supporting your website and social media. But um, an amazing, amazing show, and it's like all the best ones. It's leaving me with things to think about <laughs> afterwards. It's the ones that, it's like when you leave a, a mo the movie theater and the movie's still playing in your head when you're lying in bed. That's one's going to happen to me tonight when I'll be still running over some of the things you said. Really important work. So um. Again, I'll say people can get in contact with you via the website. Um, uh, we'll recommend David R. Holland's amazing web, uh, website about Gladwell Canal and walking the battlefield there. But um, yeah, brilliant presentation. And thank everybody for your for your comments as we've been going along. So um, I, I would say thank you very much for sharing with us. And I, I, the, the, the five minutes thank or so you. you talked about those cases when you were talking about the dental records, what, of course, that would equate to actually hours and hours, days and days and weeks and weeks of work. And I'm guessing one of the strings to your bow now is an understanding of dental care as well. Is one of the things you've become familiar with. <laughs> um, I'm 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 starting to pick it up a little bit. Um, I I'm certainly not an expert by any means, um, but I can I can recognize I can recognize when somebody's got a set of dentures and say, oh, mm -hmm. all right, well that that could potentially be this person. Um, I really the, the ins and outs are still a bit of a mystery to me um dental is my hardest one uh okay. but yeah no, it's um yeah it's it's it's, it's a lot of work giving us an idea of there are different ways of using paperwork david o'keefe has just joined us so of course use paperwork to understand the real reason behind the dieppe raid and he's on his way or probably already in france up at the Ep anniversary next mm -hmm. next week but that was to determine the reasons behind an operation, but you are using the paperwork and archives and reports 
for a very different and very personal reason, but but uh, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the same use of archival information that is the revolution, as we said a few minutes ago, of the of mm -hmm. the amount of information being available, and and we can have a big discussion about the the, the various governments that are not releasing their information, keeping things behind paywalls, and and uh, and that kind of thing. And the point is, the more information that is available freely, the more people like yourself can use it for not just writing histories, but as I say, mm -hmm. um, tying up family um, tragedies. Yeah, and all the all the sources um, that I shared in there are public domain. Um, you can get it's sometimes it's sometimes a challenge. You have to submit a Freedom of Information Act request, or you have to send one to the um, uh, to the National Archives directly. It, they got a big backlog because they were closed for so long. It's going to take a very very long time to get some of these these files, but yeah. it's all it's all there. Um, it's yeah. just kind of knowing knowing where to look and knowing what you need. Um, and then making those connections to fill in the rest of the blanks. Yep. So astonishing, that, astonishing the, amount of paperwork out there. Yeah, that would be the revolution. The number of the, the younger generation of historians coming through now will be much more familiar with this process and how to use yeah. the digital archives than the generation who are writing 30 years ago. So uh, mm -hmm. my hopes are that there'll be lots more work, more, lots more people like yourself in 10, 20 years' time taking this work on to, to even more levels. But I feel I'm going down a rabbit hole. I could just talk to you really about this. In mind, people will be coming up tomorrow, so I'll bring you back in a second. So, folks, this ground war, uh, Pacific week, so foot of the Pacific concludes tomorrow with a chat with my old mate John McManus. So, we are kind of talking about the Solomon Islands in 1942, but I expect it to be a kind of wide ranging chat about the U.S. Army. Uh, we'll touch on the Marines, but John McManus's trilogy is mainly, mainly about the U.S. Army in the Pacific, so it'll be a kind of a sprawling conversation between mates, so that'll be quite fun. And that'll be at 7 p.m. UK time or 2 p.m. Eastern Mara. And then next week, I've just put the shows on YouTube but haven't added the descriptions yet. We have the aviation in the Pacific. So lots of great guests coming your way. We're talking about the atomic uh, bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We're talking about a marine uh, 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 aviation squadrons. We're talking about all sorts of things. So, so stay tuned for that. But I'm going to bring Jeffrey back in to say goodbye. So, Jeffrey, a masterclass presentation. Thank you very much. I will extend Absolutely. anything I can do with World War II TV to help you in the future. Just just ask, and I'm sure there's lots of people watching who would say the same thing. Anything they can do. Uh, Brian Yi is offering his wife's dental services. If you need any more Great. help about dental, he's a, he's a dentist. So there's all these connections that can be made. So thank you very much. Top of my hat to you. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you all for, uh, for sticking with and listening. Brilliant. So this is Paul with World War II TV saying I will see you all again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Thanks. Bye.